Hey, hi Douglas. Hello, hey. Paul. Thanks for having me on. Hey, yeah, thanks so much for getting on. You know, we are doing this uh, big event uh, to really give hope to people. But before mm. we dive into it, maybe you can give us a brief, uh, brief introduction of yourself, like your, you know, the age, background, etc. And how long you have been in this business, not teaching, I understand you were teaching previously, or you want to give that as part of a background, it's fine with us. Lah. Um, okay, I'm Douglas Lim. I'm predominantly a comedian. I'm 44 this year. I started when I was very young in the industry. I started when I was 18 in a sitcom called Kopitiam. That was pretty much the start of my career. Of course, along the way, I got my degree in uh, teaching of English as a second language. I didn't really pursue that uh, career path. I continued to do television. From television, I went on to do MCing work as a humorous MC. And then from there, the gradual progression was to move into stand up comedy. So that's what I predominantly am. I'm a stand up comedian. However, now, with things the way they are, uh, live shows are completely um, non existent. I think we're only allowed to operate again in phase four, which is like in 2029 or something. <laughs> so in the meantime, uh, I'm doing a lot, a lot more virtual stuff and also videos uh, for social media. Yeah, okay. If I may jump in there, uh, Douglas, you have preempted my next question, which is basically, no, yeah, la, you, you know, I continue, you, no worries. Yeah, you can trust a comedian to mess up the script. La, <laughs> get this question. But uh, okay, uh, so you were basically into live shows and then... Uh, can you give us the measure of the exact impact of the outbreak of the pandemic? Uh, I'm sure health-wise you didn't suffer. I hope you did not. But in terms of your business, because uh, originally the question that popped out in our minds when we were approaching, when we were in the first dialogue, right? What was stronger than brick and mortar, which is the type of business you're in? Mm. And the obvious answer is coronavirus. So what was the impact on your business as in the gigs, money you earn and all that? Uh, so I would say I'm one of the luckier ones um, in terms of doing stand-up comedy, the demand that I, that I command. Uh, so I would get around four to five live corporate gigs a month. Uh, that's a decent, that's a very nice month, a very nice haul for me uh, um, on a monthly basis. That went down to zero. So when March 2020 hit last year, um, it was zero. And it has continued to be zero in terms of live stand-up comedy. There was one event, uh, I think when, when things loosened up a bit last year, there was one event. Uh, but otherwise, it is zero because it didn't make sense for companies to do corporate functions to do corporate functions anymore because like the, the hotels, if they were to book a hotel or a ballroom that could fit 600 people with the SOPs in place, they can put 200 max. And so that messes up budgets, you know, and then to, for them to be there and to calm me down. And, you know, last time it was laughter is the best medicine. Now laughter is the second most effective way to spread the virus, Paul. <laughs> like first is sneezing, second is laughter. So let's just say the stand-up comedy scene um, was uh, comp decapitated, uh, very similar to the tourism industry. Um, I would say aviation, very similar. Okay, so the, so even when they, it was relieved temporarily, you know, we have gone through a number of phases of the lockdown, some of which there was partial restrictions lifted. So theoretically, you could have 200 or 100. Obviously, the numbers come down, the, the remuneration goes down, but not only remuneration, the bookings also go down because uh, people, even if the thing was lifted, people will be very cautious to go. Is that true? Yes, yeah, it's, it's very true. And so this is me as a individual freelance stand-up comedian. I've got friends in the comedy industry who have venues, you know, so like the two main venues that were doing stand-up comedy uh, on a daily basis, one crack house comedy, Tamantan Dr. Ismail, the other one, Joke Factory in Publica. Can you imagine? I mean, that's, as it is, they're not very big, you know, so they're a, a space, very cozy space. You can fit 80 to 160 people, 150, you know, packs. Uh, comfortably and they charge very cheap then that to, to encourage people to come and watch stand-up comedy it's one of the genres that is slowly building gaining momentum so we charge you know uh, we don't charge a premium they, they charge very you know, easy 20 ringgit 30 ringgit 
to try and get people to come and watch stand-up comedy and suddenly you you are handicapped you are chopped off at the legs you know your your club that can usually fit 120 people you're down to 40 max um and the experience that you're providing as well uh you know stand-up comedy people like to be together with their friends sitting close laughing together sharing that joke like oh did you hear that now having to sit a meter you know you get what i'm saying like yeah. couples show up to the show and they have to be separated so that clearly affected the the comedy clubs a lot uh, as far as i know they're both not operating they've not been operating like very similar to cinemas uh, they've, they've stopped so overheads continue and the acts that they're supposed to hire the acts that rely on these comedy clubs to do shows maybe one show a week two shows a week that's all gone yeah okay yeah you know you know douglas uh it, it reminds you mentioned cinema just now because there is uh i know somebody who was in one of these major seminar companies uh i wouldn't name which one and the person got laid off and then applied to perkeso for retrenchment benefits so we say you got to look for a new job new new type of skill and the guy was out at sea completely because all he knew was the live cinemas every weekend is full. People buy popcorn, buy Coca Cola and Pepsi and what have you. That's gone. So how long was it before you realized? Were you reeling before you had to put together a plan B? How many months? Yeah, I mean, like a lot of people, I was just praying and and hoping that things would get better, that we would have a handle on it. Like the first lockdown, the serious one, I think it was two months. I think about or two and a half months of like complete lockdown. So I was thinking like, okay, well, you know, I, we've seen, we, we, we saw how New Zealand dealt with it, how Taiwan dealt with it, how South Korea, we're like, all right, all right, this, this thing can be contained and life can get back to normal. So we were really looking forward to that. We still had plans uh, with uh, TV shows, uh, uh, movies, you know, to shoot certain projects. Now mind, we push, we push to later in the year, uh, that was 2020. And then, um, it just started to dawn on me like, hey, I don't think so. Like, because only very few countries are handling this well. And America was going through it very badly at that, at that time. Uh, and I saw all these like very famous talk show hosts having to do their shows back home. You know, they, they, they couldn't do it in the studios anymore because they couldn't have studio audience. And I was looking at that and I'm going, oh man, like, but they're doing it. I mean, they, they are managing it somehow. And I, I guess they have budget. They've got the network power, you know, but people like us, um, so I think it was Re one of the earliest people who did it was Rizal and Gazel. He took part. He was part of a virtual stand-up comedy show um, that involved a few countries: uh, Hong Kong, I think, Vietnam, Malaysia was part of it. We were on the Asia side. It was a twenty-four hour thing, and we tried it, and it was very awkward. Uh, but there were some people who watched it, and the feedback was, "Yeah, you know, it's it's guys, it's, it's, we understand it's very awkward for you to do stand-up in front of a camera." with no live feedback, so to speak, you know, but hey, we were watching, it was quite, you know, the situation is very gloomy and you cheered us up. And so that was a bit of encouragement that I got. And then after that, more and more companies started doing this. And so that became kind of um, something I looked into, something I, I tried to do more and more often. I had to buy you no know, equipment to accommodate that request. Uh, and at the same time, I started doing just uh, silly videos for social media, I did with no real financial um, uh, thought to it. I just just I just did it just for a laugh. It's what I do. I, I I'm addicted to comedy, so I did it. Uh, people laugh, and that brought more opportunities where brands were like, "Hey, that video was funny. Could you do one?" But I would like to sponsor it. Just put my brand in somewhere um, uh, to to you know uh, to more of these type of. Uh, money oriented or you know videos that could bring you some income like. okay okay you know just uh what what luckily in Perkeso we we i'm, I'm very blessed uh, uh that we those of us who are here we are essential service we had to help the public we had to equip ourselves with going online because prior to the pandemic uh my role is i'm head of transformation so we are supposed to do this high-tech stuff so we only had maybe 30 people a month on virtual meetings. Uh -huh. But the minute it hit, we had to run one month of webinars. We used our medical team to train people on all the health steps we have to take. 
hand washing, masking, and all these things. Mm. So that one month, uh, we had 50 people, uh, 70 people, uh, 90 people. It went up to 200 before we even realized we had a, license, a version of the virtual meeting which was kept at 200. And then after that, we went on to 300 and then we upgraded. And today, uh, just in our organization alone, probably in any given day, uh, there will be about three different times of the day, like a total maybe 3,000 people engaged in virtual meetings. But it took us a few months you know, of transition. Mm. And then we saw people suffer because, you know, the, when the government uh, launched the ERP and PSU schemes to help, Pekeso was the one of the biggest vehicles to uh, give out the money. And then we saw the hundreds of thousands of people that needed help. So for yourself, Douglas, and your... I, I think you can well represent the fraternity of this entertainment industry. The actual picking up of skills, the type of skills, how long do it take you? I mean, yala, you can click and do Zoom, but you you got to be good at it, no? But uh, to, to make it meaningful, otherwise you... Comedy is one thing, but you don't want to make it absolute fool of yourself to the point people think you're stupid. So how, how do you... Uh, how do you? How long do you take to actually pick up some decent skills to say then? Then that, that's why the people call you and say, hey, Douglas, maybe you can do this thing for us and pay for it, lah. It was definitely a, just a, a step by step process. Like anyway, you don't start and fly. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, I started by crawling. So just shoot something on the handphone. I mean, if kids that are nine, ten years old can make a video using their handphone, uh, it doesn't require that much skills. I mean, kids learn much faster. I granted. But what, what do they have? They've got a phone and they've got a thumb, you know, and they can, you can do a video that way. Um, and so I'm a bit more old school because I was in, you know, like real product, TV productions, movie production. So I know a little bit more about uh, what goes into a production. I didn't have firsthand knowledge. I didn't do those things like lights, uh, sound, camera work. I didn't do that. I was a performer and I was a writer. So I, I leveraged on that. So that was my, those were my strengths. I know, uh, writing and performing. And so just try not to suck on the other fronts because you're on your own now. You can't invite a, a group, a team of uh, uh, equipment, a team of uh, what do you call that production crew to your house. So, you know, I started off with a camera phone and then, you know, I bought one little light to help me with the light. Then I upgraded to a ring light. And then I bought an Osmo Pocket, a small camera, which is like a really small. Uh, so, you know, quality not very good. Depth of field is not good. But it was, it, why I wanted it was because it was small. And the, and the thing had a like face detection system. So I, I could put it there and I could move and the, and the camera would move by itself. So I didn't need a cameraman. Um, okay. I just put it there and then do my stuff and the thing would follow. Uh, autofocus and all that. Then I upgraded to you know bigger lights, bought a green screen. Um, and learned how to do that, how to basically shoot on a green screen and make it look like, you know, it's another background, upgrade it to a DSLR. It's all step-by-step -step stuff, you know, like I've, like this, you know, upgrading from a normal mic to a, to a condenser mic. Um, and I've also got some lapel mics to help me with that. So it's just that. And, and I think the willingness to work, I think that's just kind of, part of it where I I have done a lot of things that have gotten attention. I have done a lot of things that, uh, you know, like I put in the effort and I see the results. But at the same time, I've also done a lot of things where I've seen no results. <laughs> no results, no reaction. So I, I maybe I'm a bit more mature, more resilient that way to realize that sometimes, you, you know, the, just because you do something really hard and you try re your best for three months, doesn't mean you're going to get results. Doesn't mean people are going to notice, <laughs> you know, but if, but you got to do it. And it also helped that I like what I was doing, you know, doing comedy. Um, so maybe that helped me continue and persevere, I'm guessing. Okay. You know, Douglas, I, I tune in to one of the sessions where you were having a dialogue with uh, Dato Sri Wong Chun Wai, <laughs> and you, you talked about which is which led us to this topic of this uh, session, which is adaptability. We take this session as adaptability, the key to survival. And I think you brought up two points to Dato Sri Wong Chun Wai, which was that uh, one is you had to uh, adapt to the different nuances of social media. 
mm. the analytics right down to the time of transmission. And you mentioned some of this, you talked about equipment, but the whole social media business is a lot more than I think what people do. And I, after this, I would like to, you to maybe share a bit more because these are actual tips for people out there who might be faced in parallel kind of situations, not necessarily entertainment, but it could be teaching. Uh, because there are a lot of people in the teaching profession, the colleges have shut down completely. Lecturers who are out there previously, they go in. So that's one. And two is uh, you change your target. Your, your media used to be almost 100% in English, if not 100%, right? Mm -hmm. And then you went to a Bahasa thing and then people was like, why did Douglas keep that best, best kept secret that he can speak Bahasa so well, almost like a native speaker? Uh, so these two points of adaptability and more for the audience out there, but through the sharing of your experience, uh, can you give some concrete tips? Uh, because we are targeting a huge audience out there and uh, today they're not looking for entertainment. So if they get any laughs, is maybe they, call, they see you smiling right now, they will laugh. Lah. But the purpose of this is not for laughs, but for the tips that like you say, don't give up. And what else could you do by way of adaptability and from your own experience and even... If you can preach a little bit, what would you preach? I think, well, from what the one thing you can definitely practice is a sense of humility, I think, uh, and just acknowledging that things have changed. Uh, and it's not your fault. Huh? Maybe, you, you know, you may think, you know, I didn't do anything to deserve this, man. I didn't do anything for the business to shut down. I didn't do anything for, for the, for the, the arts industry to be completely neglected. Yeah, yeah it's, no one is saying it's your fault and no one is saying you deserve it. Uh, but you have to have the humility and the awareness to know that this is it. This is what's happening. And I don't know when things are going to change for the better. So to acknowledge that and to accept that, to have the humility to know that, uh, well, I'm not as, as comfortable and as amazing and as as useful as I am anymore. And people now have different ones. They have, I'm also limited in how I can do things. So I think that's the first. Um, the second would be to just be aware and watch. I mean, check out what, what you have for the transmission of entertainment or knowledge or skills. What you have is what other people have. So what do you have? A laptop, a handphone, a computer these are the things that are available and that people are using to to transmit and to receive in, uh, information or you know or, or skills or entertainment so check out your peers some of the people that you that you know in your niche market what are they doing online what are they doing virtually because virtually seems to be the industry that has survived and thrived okay fine maybe you are in glove making well, good for you <laughs> you know uh <laughs> well done right um but let's say you're not you know and you're in, in education or you're in entertainment so look at your niche and see what people are doing you you watch youtube these like online courses are popping up left right center everyone's got some skill to teach i'm sure you have your skill too you just got to find what's what that, that niche i went into it for a while uh, as well uh, i was teaching how to make how to make funny videos. So I wasn't teaching how to do stand-up comedy. I wasn't teaching comedy. I was teaching very specific how to make funny videos. Why? Well, because funny videos get shared. So that if you have a product, maybe you can you can sell that product or promote the product via a funny video. You don't have to pay the platform. You don't have to pay YouTube or Facebook a lot of money for, for advertising. So that was what I wanted to, you know, I thought people might benefit from it. So that's something you can do. Find a skill that you have that can be transferable um, uh, online. But here's the catch. You have to know, and this was thought to be by one of the, you know, the most well-known uh, uh, online, uh, you know, coaches, uh, Ping Jun is his name. He said, what, what's the difference between the skill that you have and something that people can get free online? So if let's say you're teaching, let's say you're teaching, you know, fitness, like how to have six pack abs. Ping Jun would say, so what's different from your course? What's different from your course from like, what's available for free on YouTube? Why should people pay you? Find that, find that reason. If not, what's the point, right? So, or, or you could take a step and go like, okay, never mind. 
I'll just do it. I'll do it for YouTube. I'll do it for free. And But if I get traction, then YouTube also pays me. So there's also another way there. That's another way. It's a bit slower uh, than direct online uh, cl uh, classes. But there are ways and it's there. It's not a, it's not a, a secret that you go to, uh, you go climb a mountain and try and find out. No, it's, it's, it's all there. You've got to open your eyes and uh, first of all, admit that things have changed and that you have to change and then go and look. Douglas, which leads me to a point, and again, it came from the uh, dialogue we had with uh, uh, Dato Sri Wong Chun Wai. You were talking about being resourceful and with your props, because you said you found a lot of props from your kitchen. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, even your wife's scarves and things like that, and resourcefulness, <laughs> obviously. Uh, can you talk a bit more about the resourcefulness, whether it's something uh, innate, God-given, or you could you have to look out and what motivates you to be more resourceful just because you could be born resourceful or what? Tell us a bit more about your... your because it has become great entertainment value. One of your videos, you put a blooming bead, plastic uh, what food container over your... and it became your face mask or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, okay, I never used to be that way. Uh, if you ask my friends, I was one of the most spendthrift uh, people that you, that you know. Like, I would... I would go out and buy a brinjal like for I think it was 18, 18 ringgit. And my friend was saying, Douglas, this is one of the most expensive brinjals I've ever seen. I would just go and buy a brinjal to use it once in a comedy show. Because I was doing a comedy show and there was one part where I was like, oh man, wouldn't it be funny if I had like a chili paddy, a carrot and a brinjal. And I went to the supermarket and it happened to be like one of those upmarket supermarkets. And I bought a packet of chili padi, some carrots, and one brinjal. And I was just for one show. So that was what I was. Am I naturally resourceful? No. Um, but the MCO has made it that way. I can, you can't. There are a lot more characters that I have that I've had to put on hold because I can't go out and get the costumes. So uh, I have to make them with what I have uh, here. So for the the tupperware when it was like I was alone at home. I didn't have a mask, so I went looking around. I wanted to use the cover at first, the, the flat cover, but then it hurt my nose, <laughs> and it flattened it. It was a bit painful. <laughs> so you know, I just I grabbed whatever I, I could. Uh, like the like the, the the one this turban that I have is a quick drying towel uh, that my wife uses for her hiking trips. Uh, a big kaftan that I that I wear is like a baju kelawa. So. The situation changed and I, I ended up just using what I, what I had um, um, here. Like if, if, if not for the MCO and I had to do videos, I'll tell you, Paul, I would have rented a studio. I would have gone out, rented a studio, got a friend's action, you know, a team to and set up and do it. I would not have learned anything. I would not have even bothered to, to, to venture into editing and, and and uh, mild effects and subtitling and camera and lights. But because so, of the MCO, it, what are you so going to do? This uh, resourcefulness, adaptability, this has uh, actually given you a completely new skill set in being able to look for things, package, and you really, op really learn to optimize the things around you, right? Um, yeah, both. It was a learning, a big learning curve uh, for me and as well as my, my wife, because, you know, we, we are in this house together and we've got to run shows like sessions like this is quite easy right it's just you me and we're talking you know so not much work so but some sometimes i do uh like uh what do you call this uh emceeing work or, or hosting work where there are games there's awards and stuff like that so last time it used to be you at the venue so you had the venue and then there's a producer there's the showrunner there's your pa so information gets spread quickly because as the mc you got to go on stage guys this is what's happening next mr bala come up now stand by the 10 10 year service award winners on your left lucky draw is happening here come to so you all this information is there for you people are running around with walkie talkies giving information to do a virtual gig oh yo we are all <laughs> we are all over the place we are literally not there we are everywhere. So, so like my wife, who 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 obviously helps me. Out, she's on a what on a on a phone with a WhatsApp group and a whiteboard, like sit, sitting there to give me information. Last minute, I go like, okay. So, I mean, next we have uh, we're going to have the awards uh, uh, ceremony, and then the whiteboard comes up and you go like like uh, Dato Balan not ready. 
coming up ah uh, in a short while and then you know we've information just going on okay we've got to stall and so she's got to go grab my guitar and bring it here okay guys let's i tell you what i belanja you one song first <laughs> take up the guitar and start singing you know because datuk balan i don't know who, i don't know who datuk balan is i'm just making this guy up but he's he datuk balan's connection was like was like faulty or something like that you know so it's just things like that where if not what are you gonna do sit there and go like uh sorry guys uh we have to wait for your ceo uh. <laughs> you want you want to cannot fire uh. <laughs> you gotta do lah. You know, Douglas. On this point, uh, uh, this is for the future. I, I would like to take this up with you in the future because this whole experience of like what you said, making do and putting a, an online show together. This whole thing about resourcefulness. I think it is a topic on its own, and uh, because you know this whole event for Perkeso. Is driven by our employment services, the team of people that runs weekly sessions, and uh, per session they have about three hundred people, and usually sometimes they go up to seven hundred. They do this a few times a week, in terms of new skills, and, and which is what this this session is about as well. Mm. We we want the audience out there to take this home and say, hey, uh, I learned something from Douglas Lim today, and on top of besides you laugh lah, okay, we laugh at that right now, but. Uh, uh, something we want to do something in future gives gives a thought and so we'll take this for the future but uh having said that uh, you know like you said you have to adapt um uh, is there any area where you could share with us where you found a huge challenge to adapt because uh, you know you say your your wife has helped you uh but you are in the same house trying to do the same thing things a different way you are trying to cope she's trying to cope Tell us, can you share with us the, the challenges where you ran into each other, shouted at each other if that happened at all, when the Douglas Lim at home may not be the Douglas Lim we see on the screen. Uh, what are some of the challenges which you could share with people to say, look, you're going to work from home or you're going to do things differently. You are going to face these challenges and these realities as well. Um, so I don't know how this would apply to, to everyone, but... Uh, just very you'd be, you'd be surprised at how mundane the challenges can be but how these mundane challenges can really mess with your head and if you're not you know if you're not resilient and you're not disciplined it could really kill you like a simple thing just like for some reason your camera does not want to cooperate with your laptop one day it's happened to me like this camera and this laptop they work perfectly this is working perfectly now but there was one gig that we had, we set everything up, we thought it was all good, all go. And then the, 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 the organizer goes, okay, Douglas is on in like 10 seconds, boop, I'm go, bam. And just, they refuse to talk to each other. And so I'm there, uh, and my mic is on, I'm going, guys, guys, don't worry, I'm still here. People are coming, coming hey, where are you, where are you? Meanwhile, you know, my wife is getting messages from the client, look, what the hell, is, what's, what's going on? Like, you know, where, where is Douglas name? And, and so, you know, stay calm. Because, you know, it, by right, I could expect to be shouted from that side, what's going on, you know, like, and we're checking wires and stuff like that. So shut, no, shut down the camera, try it again. If it doesn't work, push to my backup camera, which is the laptop camera. So just know that this, know that, uh, be, be prepared that, oh, when it comes to technology, things are going to go, <laughs> things are going to fail. The more tech you have, the more failure you're going to have. Uh, you know, little challenges like I, I could be shooting halfway. I got to have a lot of pets, right? I'm shooting halfway and one of them decides to, to pick a fight with another person. And then so, 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 so the whole bunch of noise coming there and, and, I'm, and I'm on top, you know, and I'll be like, who's taking care of things down there? But, you know, it's just things like that where you understand look, it's going to happen. You are not working in an isolated, uh, you know, studio where everything is controlled anymore. You are at home. And I think also knowing that everyone else knows this. People are going to ex accept that you have limitations, but they are going to be impressed by your resilience in, in trying your best to overcome these limitations. Yeah. You know, Douglas, there's a very old uh, management video. I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to quote it because it just tells, shows my age. Uh, there's this old management video called Who Moved My Cheese? Are you young enough to... I, I, I read the book. 
Okay, it was a book, yeah, and then there's this video that came about it, and basically, uh, where the the these rats they go and eat every day, and one day another rat with uh two rats they go out and look look for new cheese all the time, and these guys were gone so comfortable, and this is what the pandemic has done to many people. Mm. Now, uh, sometimes it is the whole industry that collapses. Sometimes it's partial. So your industry, which part of that cheese will never return or is going to return in such drips and drabs that you better not think of making money from that anymore, from your sector. And it may not be comedy. It could be, you know, the music or whatever, the entertainment world. If I can ask you to just speculate on just the broader entertainment scene, which part, which part of the cheese has gone away and you think not going to come back substantially enough for people to hope for it? Um, I, I wouldn't know. I don't know that. I don't have that deep a knowledge. And of course, I can't tell the future. I, I, but I would like to think that the cheese has not gone forever. That the cheese is, is on hold. Uh, okay. Because we have seen concerts happening in the US. So, mm-hmm. so big concerts in stadiums. We saw the um, Olympics happen. Although, although you could see, right, the Olympics, there were some events where no audience. Right, the indoor yeah. events, the badminton events, I think it was, they had no audience. Uh, but, you know, the stadiums were packed. We saw Euro uh, and we saw people at the stadiums. So, I am optimistic that uh, music, uh, so music concerts, DJ, you know, like these big uh, events, the raves, I think they will come back. But let's, I would say, give it maybe one and a half, two years. I think. Yeah. So for, for, for like stand-up comedy, okay, wait, before that, for TV and movies, I think shooting will still continue because although cinemas have been closed, I, and I wish them all the, I wish that we can get back as fast as possible because cinema is, it, they can control. Uh, I really believe cinemas, have the ability and the manpower to execute the SOPs to the best of their ability to make sure that people are socially distanced and the and the spread is controlled. So I really don't understand why cinemas are shut down. I, I don't know, I don't think I've heard of any cinema clusters. But again, I could be wrong, okay? Never mind. Um, because they really drive a lot of industries. The movie industry, the you know, the shooting industry, the, the production, it, that's all... It, it, the cinema is a big part. However, uh, pay TV, uh, satellite TV, and all have come to the rescue in a sense where you can now shoot an entire movie and put it uh, on Astro or on Netflix or you know where where they would pay you and then you 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 still get to make some money. Okay, and uh, I, I think that should be able to, to show up soon after more vaccination happens. More people are kind of uh, people in the industry are all vaccinated, and so we can have strict SOPs while shooting, or we at least we know. Who has gone where what contacted what okay for stand-up comedy here is where i am a little bit concerned comedy stand-up comedy used to be a celebration in the sense that when people had a good year and the company had a good year they've made some money uh they have a award ceremony they have a dinner and dance they've got a theme where people come dressed and so we're all there and people are happy and they're celebrating you know they've made ipo or whatever and then a comedian comes on happy let's tell some jokes and it's a celebration the shows that i'm doing now virtually have become more therapeutic in other words uh the the request is not like hey douglas our company has done well we're you know feeling you know, can you come and do it now it's more like uh, Douglas, uh, our people are very stressed. <laughs> they, are, they are working from home. Uh, things are gloomy. Morale is a bit low. Could you could you come on and maybe just cheer us up, tell some jokes? So we've moved, so from the the comedy that I do has kind of moved into that niche. Um, so I don't know what's gonna what's gonna happen moving forward because I think these companies realize that hey, a lot cheaper to have comedy done this way <laughs> as opposed to hiring. A ballroom, right? Buying meals, having an MC, you know, getting everyone after going home, you know, and then dress up and then come back to the venue 
and then re- then pay for the comedian to show up. How about this, right? Our dinner, we do dinner. Separately, we do dinner. Right? We can buy everything. We save on the comedian there. We call the, the comedian to, to do online first. Like, while we, we're all working from home anyway. Just after a while, come on in and we'll do some comedy. I'm just afraid that might happen. But I don't know. I still, I would still like to think that live stand-up comedy will come back. It's the best way to enjoy comedy, I feel. Um, <laughs> but I've, I was suspicious some... Some really calculative com- some really calculative companies will be like, hmm. <laughs> you better don't give them ideas that they're listening to you right now. <laughs> hey Douglas, uh, you were talking about, but you know this uh, that the difference now is virtual versus you know people having a party. I've heard before and I read, uh, I can't remember where I heard it from, where you know the performers they they draw a lot of energy from the live audience. Yeah. And and especially in, in comedy, of course, if it falls flat, then you also suffer. Lah. But when the, the energy really responds, I, I remember, uh, what's this this guy, Russell Peters, he, he looks at the audience out there and he sees somebody fidgeting somewhere and he'll pick on that guy and then he gets like two minutes of comedy from there. Everybody laughs at the poor guy or poor lady's expense, but all that is gone. So from a, from a comedian's perspective, how does it feel performing in front of a camera from your perspective? Actually, I would uh, politely disagree with you on that one, Paul. In fact, it is even easier now. That one is, that one is called playing the crowd or playing the room. That okay. technique that they use when you look around, you pick on one guy and then we do some comedy. That's actually much easier now uh, in, in, in virtual if they have the cameras on. Because now, literally everybody who's online can see that person no matter where you're sitting. Last time, if it's in a big venue, I pick on someone in front, the people at the back can't see anything. The people at the back will be like, lost. What joke is this? Who, what, what's he talking about? Who's, he, what, who's, who's the guy? Those guys in the cheap seats cannot see you. Lah. Yeah, basically, or people behind. Uh, but now online, you can see them. Not only can you see them, you can see what's happening behind them. <laughs> so so you, uh, I would say respectfully, I would have to disagree. That part okay, is still sure. available in stand-up if they've got the cameras on. Uh, we can still engage uh, in, in things like that. What we can't do is hear your laughter because we can't have your mics on. If their mics are all on, it's going to you know, echo and, and you know, your, your children behind dogs and, and it just gets very, very noisy. But the adv- see, so there are certain advantages in doing uh, virtual stand-up. A lot of disadvantages, disadvantages in the, in the sense where there's no feel, there's no live feel. You're not, you know, you're, not, you're not standing up on stage. There's no one there. To hear laughter come directly from the floor to you is addictive. It's, it, it fills you with endorphins. It feels very good. You see them laughing, you know, you, you, you hear, you hear the, and you feel the energy. So that's all gone. Uh, but in doing virtual, you get to see their thoughts because they're chatting. You, we, we would, when, we did virtu- when we did live stand up, all I would hear was ha 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 ha. Maybe one or two, you know, so we'll say like, wow, wow, he said that. Ah. Or like, you know, one person go, eh, disgusting, bro. You know, one voice here and there. In virtual stand up, it's literally, you see, wow, all of the comments, come on, cannot, bro. Hey, hey, why, why you do like this? And some people who don't understand the joke, they're explaining the joke to their friends. So there's, there's communication happening in virtual stand up, and that is something new. That is something I hope to be able to incorporate in my in my comedy and and uh, cap- uh, capitalize on this because you could never do it live because life is you can't have them talking to each other and sharing bits of information then you need them in life they're going to talk listen to you one one way uh, communication ha 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 i give back to you this way in virtual i've seen that hey this multilateral communication thing might actually work i just haven't found a way to fully capitalize on it yet it leads me to this uh, question. By the way, congratulations, Douglas. You have a, a gig with uh, Fly FM or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I do morning radio on Fly FM. Yeah. Which, which brings me to a point. Huh? I mean, uh, this was something you didn't do previously, right? So is it a result of your successful adaptation to the situation of going online and now they ask you for this show? I mean, the radio has been on forever. But now you have made it a science already, almost the Douglas Lim way. Uh, is this ad- attributed to that because so you have adapted and Fly FM saw that a new line of business for you? 
I would like to think so. I think I would like to think that I have made enough noise online. I have managed to make enough uh, a bit a, enough of an impact for people to want to listen to me to, to engage with my content. And I guess Fly FM saw that and said, like, hey, let's put this guy in radio. Uh, radio works. I mean, it's it's you know it's on air. Um, he doesn't see anybody. You don't see anybody <laughs> like live. You're in a a studio, it goes out to people listening at home. It's pretty much similar to what I do here. So yeah, maybe maybe that is what has happened. Although I have been called before uh, to do radio. Uh, and um, I've usually kind of step, step, taken a step back because I wasn't morning radio in, uh, in, uh, for morning radio. Uh, I wasn't prepared to make the sacrifices because for morning radio, uh, most announcers, you, you ask them 10 o'clock, 10 p.m. is nighttime. 10 p.m. is good night. So prior to the MCO, a lot of things were still happening at 10 p.m., 11 p.m., 12 p.m., 1 p.m. And I would be out there <laughs> enjoying these things. So um, I wasn't prepared to sacrifice. Uh, but now <laughs> everything's closed, Paul. <laughs> Nothing happening. The poor burger store also got to close at 10 p.m. So I might as well sleep. all dressed up and nowhere to go. <laughs> you know, so I think the timing was right for me to go like, well, yeah, I guess I'm a bit, I'm a bit older now. I really should be slowing down on, you know, all these things. And by the way, they're closed. So, uh, yeah, just um, take up a new challenge, but still a whole different set of skills to learn uh, for radio. And I'm very glad to have a team that is dedicated to helping this slow, plodding, 44-year-old brain try and adapt and learn new things. I've got a young team, a very dedicated team at Fly FM, uh, and they're very helpful. They, you know, they guide me along the way. Um, we've, also, we've also got the older people, uh, you know, those, the, the, the hey, legends of radio. Talk about older people, uh, you're trying to take a knock at me. Uh. Not you, uh, but no, but no, but legends like you, legends like you, legends of radio who are there, you know, who are coming together to, to, to help me make this transition as smooth as possible. And I'm very, very grateful for them. Yeah. Douglas, when the, I mean, eventually uh, the virus has got to go and find somewhere else where no, no human beings to infect uh, but uh, leave, uh, and leave us alone. Uh, do you think you operate, what, where, what's your vision? I know we like to get back to live shows. There will be live shows, but what would be your operating business model be in terms of balance between live and online and the different types of gigs? And let's say as you move on in life, you, you may not want to be cracking jokes at one o'clock in the morning, whereas this model allows you to be doing it at 10 o'clock in the morning and making money when somebody's viewing you at 11 o'clock at night or people suffering from insomnia watching you at night and you still make money. Would, yeah. How much of your model would change or what sort of model do you have in mind? I would think the base model still stays the same where live stand-up shows so that would probably be between the you know the 8 p.m 9 p.m 10 p.m slot that's always been there so i hope that one comes back so i can i can do things there having comedy uh, at like uh 3 p.m 4 p.m 5 p.m was unheard of but now it's virtual that might be a thing because i uh, companies can be like hey we're all working anyway right everybody's supposed to be working nine to five how about to reward our workforce, our staff, or to give them a bit of a perk, you know? Um, on Friday or on Thursday, okay, this Thursday, we work until 4 p.m. So 4 p.m., everybody stop working, get online. Our CEO or will come, you know, just give some report or give some, uh, some uh, motivational talk and stuff like that. And then we call a comedian or call a singer or, you know, call a magician, whatever lah. You know, call us to, to, to show up because we know how we know we know how to do our things online already, ma. We know how to do stand up online. Uh, some singers have want to do like concerts online. Magicians can do online shows. We know already. So then we should we show up four fifteen in the in the evening. Uh, we do some jokes, do our performance. People are happy a bit. Okay, five o'clock, guys. Thank you so much. Done. Sao kong, go home. So maybe now we can have a, a window of opportunity to make some income at that at that part you know uh and then i still hope to be doing some shoots uh for tv and stuff like that maybe i can do if i can land myself a, a game show host that's, that's like one of my dreams to be like a, a game show host so maybe we can shoot that in the morning you know uh we can start at, at eight or nine in the morning in a studio 
wrap up at about uh, one o'clock, have my lunch, you know, come home. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to m- multiple streams uh, 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 of income. And of course, social media will always be there. Lah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hey Douglas, uh, it's time to wrap up. I want to do this, uh, uh, this before we go. Uh, but first, before I post the last thing for you is actually to thank you on behalf of all those people. I understand I've never met uh, them. But I understand the frontliners in the hospitals, they are also dog tired, but they will have a quicker lunch to take that break to listen to you among the other and your, your, your fellow comedians that have provided relief. So hey, thank you very much. That is not a question. That is just an acknowledgement of the thanks. A big shout out to you and your community of comedians. I think you have done that huge service to the people uh, who are really literally risking their lives to save people uh, and so that's thank you so uh, just a, a, a parting thing uh, like you said adaptability adaptability key to survival uh, any wise words from Douglas Lim to them last piece of advice for the we, we might have a very big audience out here we don't know live we are not checking the numbers yet but uh, our goal was to reach out to 40,000 not to break any records of sorts but we really want to make sure this whole uh, event because we have got the different people coming to give tips to the company, to the employees, to the self-employed and all that. Uh, in terms of adaptability, how to survive this, any last words from, from you? Um, I think we have to really understand and, and as dr- I don't want to sound dramatic, but we are at war. <laughs> uh, and I think to, to a lot of us, we have no idea what that means. My dad was in a war, you know, he, well, a smallish, he was in the armed forces. So he, he knew, so he went through emergency, emergency, yeah, you know, and, you know, with the communists and stuff like that. So, and he, he studied war. And so he, so for him, it was like, uh, in war, the way you think normally doesn't work. Okay. And so we've got to acknowledge that we are at war. This is a v- peculiar war where we win by not sticking together. We win by actually being apart. Uh, but sacrifices have to be made. Um, and the, the needs and the well-being of the collective need to be in the forefront, not just from us, everybody, the leadership, the people who, 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 who execute and people like, like us. So I guess what we can do is just number one, really take care of ourselves, like take care of ourselves. Imagine like we are a kid and we are trying to take care of this kid to the best of our ability. Take care of yourself that way. And then take care of each other. I think that's all we can do for now. Hey, thanks very much, Douglas. Really, it has been a, a privilege for me, a pleasure. Uh, and we, we, and of course, because this is an online thing, uh, we, we will be capturing this and definitely sharing this. And this is actually an international conference. So I, I'm, we will be making all the different clips available to different things. And uh, I hope this becomes a legacy for us. Uh, these are hard times. But uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, in the first time we are talking on the, in a call like this as well, that we, we don't need to spread the doom and gloom because it's there everywhere. And this is a message. So thank you very much, Douglas. It has You're welcome. Been- oh. Yeah.